today? Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. I can't not believe it's almost time for Easter. This year is flying by, but it's exciting. I love Easter. Hope you guys are inviting your friends and family to come next week. We're going to have breakfast. It's going to be awesome. But for now, come on in. We're going to stand and worship. How does that sound? down the mountain of olives and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the heaven, highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Luke 19, 37 through 40. Let's pray. Father, this morning, may the stones remain silent as our voices are raised in praise to your glory and majesty. Lord, overwhelm us with a sense of your presence here today. Help us to worship you with nothing standing uh, between us and you and our hearts, Lord, that freely, set free, forgiven. Lord, may we just praise you with every fiber of our being today. We pray that you would bless the music and the message that's yet to come, that every part of this service would reflect your glory and be pleasing to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people say it. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Thank you. 
We are turning to Matthew chapter 27 this morning. So if you want to find that in your copy of God's Word. Over the course of the last several weeks, we have been taking a journey together through some of the events of Holy Week. Uh, That week began, of course, on the day that we celebrate today called Palm Sunday. I hope it's not snuck up on anybody that next week is Easter, right? And you're all going to bring someone with you on Easter Sunday, right? Yes. Let's try that again. You're all going to bring someone with you on Easter, right? Yes. Okay, now, don't lie to me in church. So you've got to do it now. Uh, so uh, today, as I said, is Palm Sunday. And this is the day that really kicked off the events of what we consider to be Holy Week. Uh, and uh, it, it's called Palm Sunday because that was the day of the triumphal entry of Jesus when the people lined the roadways going into the city with, uh, and uh, they, they cheered him on as he came in and they threw palm branches and some people even took their, their cloaks and threw them down in the road in front of him. And that was a, a treatment that was usually reserved for visiting royalty. And, and so they were hailing him. They said, you are our king. They recognized him as the son of David, as the Messiah. And they even cried out, Hosanna, and, and, and asked him, save us, son of David. So, so the week started on a really high note with, with people cheering him and, and understanding how important that he was. And yet at the same time, it was such a, a, a mountaintop experience. There was also an undercurrent of tension running through all of these events. Because there were still many things that had to happen before he got to the cross. There were still many things left to teach the disciples. There were conspiracies that were hatched and betrayals orchestrated. And by the end of the week, the tension had boiled to the surface. And it drove Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. Where he prayed in agony over the decision whether he would go forward with God's plan to bring salvation to the human race. Or if he would stop the world and get off. And just leave us all to the faith that we had richly earned for ourselves. Jesus was fully aware through this entire week of all the plots, the betrayals, and the suffering that was being prepared for him. He was fully aware that the week that had begun on such, that, such a gloriously high note was soon to be plunged into terrible tragedy. Crowds just days before had hailed him as royalty. But now at the end of the week, the crowds would take on a decidedly more deadly mood. Just a few days ago, they had lined the streets to wave their palm branches and shout Hosanna. Just a few days ago, they'd been shouting his name in praise and begging him to save them. Now they were still shouting, but their cries were quite different. Betrayed by Judas... Jesus was dragged before a gathering of of the Jewish leaders for an illegal trial. From beginning to end, their authority was rotten and underhanded. They they did not have the ability legally to do to him what they did, and yet they did it anyway. And and, and they, they took him to a trial, and of course they found him guilty. But they had no real power to do anything permanent about that. That they could give him, uh, under, under the Roman auspices, they could give him the equivalent of a slap on the wrist. And that's all the Jewish leaders could do. Now, never let one to get something like law or justice in the way of what they wanted. They quickly hustled Jesus off to the people who did have the power to do something permanent. They weren't going to leave anything to chance, though, in this whole scenario. These religious leaders, they were master manipulators. Jesus was the one that usually drew the crowds, but this time it was these evil men that put the crowd together. They had been afraid in the past to arrest Jesus because the crowd that followed him might riot. And now, as they assembled their own crowd, they were counting on that exact same fear to force the Roman proconsul to do exactly what they wanted. So the crowd gathered. And now there's little doubt that at least some of these people were the same people that had lined the streets earlier and shouted Hosanna. And now they were shouting again. This time, however, they weren't shouts of praise and hope. They were shouts of anger, fear, and violence. Matthew chapter 27, verse 20. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. 
Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. And we are left to say, how could it have come to this? What was it that Jesus had done that was so terrible that they would chant, crucify him? Well, we know the answer to that, don't we? Jesus had dared to bring God's love to a people whose leaders were not interested in love or truth or forgiveness. All those men were interested in was power for themselves. And this idea that people could relate directly to the Father threatened the very foundations of their power over them. And so when the opportunity at last arrived, these master manipulators took the people well in hand. And with all of the cunning that long years of practice could bring to bear, they caused them to raise their voice to get what they wanted. And they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. There were no palm branches or cloaks thrown in his path this time. This time he received curses and cruel mockery. Forced into a course of action that was against his better judgment, the Roman proconsul Pontius Pilate ordered that Jesus be taken away. And they led him away, and there they subjected him to such misery as we can scarcely imagine. And he thought, Pilate did, that he would be clever and that he would punish Jesus, but he would not kill him, and thought that that would satisfy the people. And, and so he, he took his punishment to the extreme, and they took him out, tied him to a stake, and they beat him with something called a scourge. That is a leather whip that has several tendrils, and, and, and in those tendrils were tied little bits of glass and rock and bone or metal, and, and they were all up and down the links. And so each time the scourge would, would go across his back, it would lay his flesh open, exposing the muscles beneath. And you can imagine that the agony must have been absolutely unbearable. The customary scourging under the, the law of Moses would have been up to, but not more than, 39 lashes. 39. They, they had to stop just shy of the 40th, because the 40th lash was forbidden by Deuteronomy 25. And, and it was commonly accepted that if a person got to the 40th lash, the 40th one would be the one that killed them. So that, that 39 and 40 was supposed to be the theoretical line between life and death. So they, they beat Jesus to within an inch of his life. And at the end of that scourging, from his neck all the way down to probably about his knees, was nothing but a raw, open mass of wounds. Many who experienced a scourging like this died before they ever got to the 39th stroke. But here's the mind-boggling thing about this whole thing. It's not the brutality, it's not the violence, or the willingness to flout justice and the law for the sake of political expediency. That stuff, sadly, is kind of normal. It, it, those practices went on all the time in the Roman Empire. The mind-boggling thing about this is, our Lord walked into Jerusalem knowing it would happen. He endured it willingly. Finished at last with their scourging, these cruel Roman guards threw a robe over the flesh that they had just violated. Have you ever had an open wound that's been covered in gauze? Is that pleasant when it sticks to it? Imagine what this must have felt like as they put the fabric over the raw, exposed flesh. It would have been absolute agony with every step that he took. And as if that weren't enough, they, they ripped down a vine off the wall. Uh, it was, it's a type of vine that grows in the area that had very long thorns on it. And they wove together a, a crown of thorns and shoved it down upon his head. Because after all, the king needs a crown, right? And this humiliation... Our Lord endured willingly. That boggles my mind. He did it willingly. 
he was forced to carry his own instrument of execution down a road that later became known as the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. They led him then out of the city to a place near the city garbage dump, a place where common criminals were often executed and left as an example to others, a hill called Golgotha. And these were the events that we commemorate on what we call Good Friday. We call it that now, but it most certainly did not seem good to anyone who was present at the scene except for those corrupt religious power brokers. At Golgotha, they proceeded to pound the nails into his hands and feet. And as the sound of a hammer ringing through the air carried, they laughed in triumph. While his enemies looked on and mocked him, they raised the cross and then settled it into place. But our Lord endured it willingly. As awful as the physical suffering was, that was not the worst part of these events. Far worse than the physical was the spiritual suffering that Jesus endured. Go again to the scriptures, Matthew 27, verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? What must Jesus have felt in that moment to cry words like these? To feel in that moment that God had forsaken him, turned his back on him, and had abandoned him to this cruel fate. My God! All of the physical agony that he had endured, it paled into insignificance at that moment as the worst agony imaginable settled on him. Because what Jesus did in that moment, the thing that caused him to feel so distant and separated from God, is that on the cross, he took the sins of the human race upon himself. He went as a substitute in our place. And there, because of that sin, he really felt that God had abandoned him. Sin separates us from God. Sin makes it impossible for us to have a right relationship with him. And so while Jesus hung on the cross, he who had never sinned in his life suddenly experienced a separation from the Father that he had never known. Verse 50. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. In suffering in such agony, Jesus at last heaved himself up as he would have had to have done on the spikes in his hand so that he could draw a deep enough breath. And he cried out. He shouted. The Gospel of John tells us what he shouted. It says that he shouted, It is finished! And then the Messiah, the hope of the human race, slumped down and died. That was Good Friday. How can something so awful, so barbaric, so violent possibly be called good? Is it because we're all a bunch of sadists? Listen, it is not the suffering and the violence that makes it good. Although we should remember it so that we never treat our salvation as something cheap. But we look at this. And we see Jesus' obedience to the Father. 
and it is good. We see in these events God's plan unfolding the way that it was meant to, to accomplish salvation, and it is good. We see our Messiah giving his life for us. Nobody took it from him. He gave his life for us. And even though it cost him beyond what is beyond our ability to fully grasp, he looked at it and he considered this sacrifice to be good. You see, we deserve what he got. That's the price of our sins. All of those things that we do and don't think much about it, the things that we say, oh, that's just really no big deal, thinking that God will understand and he'll just give us a pass, the little white lies, the greed, the gossip, the selfishness, the pettiness, the meanness that we treat others with, and we, we think it's no big thing. Listen, God does understand all of those things. God understands those things better than we do. He understands that His Son had to die for those things in order for us to be forgiven. Because the bill always comes due. The price always has to be paid. And Jesus stepped in and paid it for us. The scriptures say in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus made it possible for us to have a good relationship with God. If you don't know anything about Jewish culture and religious practice, you might not understand the significance of that very last verse that we read in Matthew. I want you to look at it again. It was verse 51. It says, Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. Now, does that really mean a whole lot to most people in, in modern-day America? Maybe not, but if you go back and put yourself in a first century mindset, you understand how big this is. The temple was divided into several different sections. There was one section that was for the Gentiles. That was the furthest out section of the temple, and they were only allowed to go in so far. After that, a little bit closer, they allowed the women to come in. And then the women had to stop, and the men got to go even further in. But even they could not penetrate into the heart of the temple. In the interior of the temple, you had an area that was called the holy place. And that was where the priests would regularly gather together to conduct worship. And in the innermost part of the temple, there was a place called the Kodesh Hakadoshim. It was the holy of holies. This was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, and they believed that this was the seat of God's presence. So the, the thing that would happen is the priests would go into the holy place, and then between the holy place and the holy of holies, there was this giant curtain, very thick curtain, that was hanging across the, the back enclosure. And it was called the parachute. And, and, and this was a wall of separation. And nobody could go back there except one time a year. And one time a year, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, could go behind the curtain to offer the blood of the sacrifice. And he would take the blood from the sacrifice and he would sprinkle it across the seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And that would supposed to represent the forgiveness of the people for the sins of that year. But only the high priest and only one time of the year could go into the very presence of God. When Jesus cried on the cross, it is finished. In that moment, as if some giant pair of hands had gripped it. The curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. No longer did anything stand between God 
and his people. The cross had bridged the gulf that was between us. The separation was ended. The tearing of, of the parachute, it, it was more than the physical tearing of a curtain. This was God's visual illustration of what had happened spiritually for all of humanity. In the horror and the darkness of the cross, a new day for all of us had dawned. A day when we could stroll boldly into the very presence of God, not fearing that we would be struck down, but knowing that we could stand forgiven and righteous before him. And he would look upon us in love. Three days later, God reaffirmed his love for us. He reaffirmed that he had done something truly good. On Good Friday, three days later, people began to catch up to what he was doing, began to understand the new reality of our relationship to him. You see, the story would have would have been nobly tragic if it had ended on the cross. But God had much more in mind for us than just some revered teacher that we were going to honor his memory and he was going to rot away in a grave somewhere. God instead wanted to give us a Savior that we could actively follow in life. That we could go in His footsteps that would walk with us and sustain us and give us what we need to live holy. And so He did. That's exactly what He gave us. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? The the women, they went out of love and respect for a man that they thought was dead. Just like you and I would would go for for a loved one. They expected that this would be a time of great sorrow and tears. They didn't have any reason to expect that instead they would find a new hope, a dawning understanding and an unexpected joy. And yet it came on the lips of an angel. He is not here. He has risen. And with those words at last, it all started to come together in their minds. The events of the past week collided with the things that Jesus has been telling them for months. And at last they began to see the reason why Jesus went through all that agony. And now that they began to truly understand who he is, what he had done, and were gripped with the idea that he had conquered even death itself, that opened up for them a new future. The cross spelled the end of sin and death, and that is incredible. But the empty tomb marked a new beginning and a future. And that's wondrous. The empty tomb stands for hope, proudly pointing ahead to our ultimate victory. It is finished, he said on the cross. He paid the price for sin. He broke through the wall of separation between God and man. And with the empty tomb, he calls us to a new life, a new beginning, free from the shackles that have held us back in the past, with a resurrected, living Savior at our sides. Nothing can hold us back. Nothing. Max Lucado in his book, Six Hours One Friday, he tells the story of a missionary who went to Brazil and he discovered there in the in the jungles a a native tribe. And they, they lived near a very large river. And when he was on the scene, they were in desperate need of medical attention because there was a very contagious disease that that was ravaging the population. Uh, So the hospital was actually not terribly far away, but they had to cross a river that they lived near in order to get from their village into the hospital. 
And they were terrified of this river because they thought that it was inhabited by evil spirits. And if they were to swim across the river, the evil spirits would take possession of them or even kill them. So this missionary explained to them, you know, I, I waded across this river and nothing happened to me. And they weren't impressed with just his words. So he took them to the bank of the river and he, and he put his hand in the water and said, see, nothing bad's happening. And they're still not impressed, not going to go in. He even waded into the water up to his waist and said, look, I'm not possessed. Nothing happened to me. And, and they still would not go into the water, no matter what he did. And so finally frustrated, he dove under the water and he swam from one side to the other. And then he crawled out on the opposite bank and said, look, I'm fine. And as they saw him come out of the water and clamber up on the other side of the bank, they got really excited. Because they saw proof with their own eyes that it would be okay. And they followed him through the water. And many people of their village got the medical attention they needed and were saved. In a real sense, this is what Jesus did for us. He entered the river of death and he came out on the other side so that we might no longer fear death, but find eternal life in him. He has shown us the way to victory. He has given us a road map all the way into eternity. He has already fought the necessary battles on our behalf. He has vanquished the enemy upon the cross, and he has risen again to show us the way to a brighter future. <clears throat> There's another story of a missionary who went to Africa, and he, he ran across a man who had become a, a Christian. And all of the, the people in his village says, why would you want to become a Christian instead of uh, one of these other religions? And, and he answers, well, it's like this. Suppose you're going down a road, and you get to a fork in the road. And standing there at the fork of the road, there's lying a corpse. And there's standing a guy. Which one are you going to ask for directions? <laughs> you need look no further than Jesus to find the right direction. He is not a dead teacher whose ideas belong in the past. He is a living Savior who is current and relevant, has already walked this path before us, and will see us safely to where we need to go. Maybe you're in need of hope this morning. Maybe you feel that life has backed you into the corner and you just can't imagine a future where things could get any better. Maybe you feel like you've done too much and God can never forgive you and you're racked by guilt because you can't even forgive yourself. Maybe you feel like you will never know happiness again. Maybe there's this dark weight hanging on you that you never see any way out of. There's supposed to be more to life than that. I invite you this morning to come to the empty tomb and find hope. I invite you to come to the cross and see that no matter how horrific it was, it was good because it's there you find forgiveness. I invite you to come to the empty tomb to find a new way into the future. I invite you to come to the feet of the risen Savior and find lasting joy, purpose, our Savior lives, and he can offer you all of that and much, much more if you will follow him. He is risen. Amen. Now, I'm going to end by teaching you something that you should remember from last year, but you'll need this for next Sunday. Early Christians were very much under a death sentence if people found out who they were. The, Rome, the, the Jews didn't like them. The Romans didn't like them. 
And so if people found out that they followed Jesus, they would have their property seized and they would even find themselves executed for it. And so when they first began to gather, many of them gathered in secret cells. And sometimes those cells would be infiltrated by people who didn't really believe. They were just on the hunt. And so these early Christians would, would give a sign and a cosign. And this was how they would identify themselves so that other people would know, I really am a Christian. Do you know how they identified themselves? They identified themselves with the resurrection. A Christian would say, he is risen. And if indeed you were a true authentic Christian, you would know that the countersign was, he is risen indeed. He is risen. So he is. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you sent us not just a sacrifice, you sent us a Savior. We thank you for what he endured on our behalf, for his willingness to see it through so that we could be saved. Oh, but Lord, we rejoice in the resurrection. We know that he is the first among many, that, that we will follow him someday into eternal life in the same manner. And so, Lord, help us to fix our hope on Jesus. Help us to build our now on Jesus. Help us, Lord, every day in every way. Help us to follow Jesus. It's in the name of that risen Savior that we pray. Amen. As we do each week, we open the altar before you. If the Lord has touched your heart and you feel the need to come and pray, you're welcome to do that. I'll be over here to the side, happy to pray with you. You come today as he calls you. Would you please stand? <clears throat> Just as I am. of announcements to call your attention to. Uh, you've seen them flashing on the screen up here, I'm sure. First off, if you're visiting with us today, we do have a gift for you over on the table. There's a visitor card if you fill out. They'll have an extremely nice mug for you. Um, the little school buses, you'll see them uh, scattered around the, the church in various places. Uh, yeah, if you want to fill those up with your loose change, that will uh, help to support the efforts of the daycare. It'll buy them supplies, like art supplies and stuff that they, they use to, to interact with the kids. And uh, we would welcome your donations toward that. Uh, Brands and Stars Variety Show is coming up April the 10th. And that is a benefit fundraiser for the Missouri Baptist Children's Home. It's a very worthy cause. We support it as part of our regular church budget, but uh, it's great to support them other ways too, and you get some entertainment out of the business too. Uh, so that's on April the 10th. Um, 
Also on April 10th, I'm going to get ahead of our slides, uh, is uh, going to be the women's gathering, their spring cleaning for Heart and Home. And uh, there's information in your bulletin. Anything you want to add about that, Cheryl? I do. Okay. I just want girlfriends to know that, uh, a little disclaimer here, we're not going to be cleaning, even though that's our theme. <laughs> spring cleaning. No, we just, we're going to talk about it. Well, there goes my plans <laughs> for the day. So, uh, Anyway, you can sign up over here, and we will be catering some sandwiches, so uh, try to sign up if you think you're going to be able to come. Thank you. All right. Uh, as I said, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we are going to be having breakfast. So come hungry, and we'll have plenty of food for everybody, and we're going to start serving that at 9. We will go through the window. We're going we're gonna to actually serve it instead of doing buffet style because we're still trying to be careful with COVID and all of that. So uh, it will be served to you, so uh, we will be as safe as we can, and there's plenty of room in the gym for everybody to, to be seated at a good distance. Uh, so I uh, want to invite you to be sure to come out for that. <clears throat> and then I think Jessica has a word for us about the daycare. Okay, so I just want to give a little update about Little Paws Daycare. Um, as of January, the board consists of myself and Chastity Adler. Oh, she's in the nursery. Chastity Adler, for those that don't know. Um, little Paws Daycare has received a wonderful charity check of $5,000 recently. So, yeah. <laughs> With that, we are planning on purchasing um, a nice swing set for the back um, and also a vacuum and stuff to vacuum the rugs back there. Um, we're going to be closing for, the se for this year, the 21st of May, and reopening in August when school starts. Our plans next year are to be open the entire time. We just There's a few things we need to do with the meal program before we open that in the summertime. Um, we have two part-time workers that you guys will get to meet on April 11th. They will be coming to church service and be getting introduced. Uh, we have five children enrolled. We passed all inspections, and we can go into full capacity next year which would be 20 in the morning and 20 in the afternoon. Uh, we, all, we also should be able to receive state assistance for children coming in as well. So those that can't pay the full amount, we're hoping to have that up and going by next year as well. Uh, the kids have been awesome. They're a great bunch of kids. We've had a great first year forming relationships with not only the kids, but their families. Uh, just wanna recognize Tatum, one of our girls that come to church, her mom, Kayla, is here with us today in the green for anybody that doesn't know. So the, yeah, yes. <laughs> the kids and the families have been great. It has been a great year, self-sustaining ministry. We just want to thank everyone for the support and continued support of Little Paws Daycare. We can't thank our sanitation team enough and all the volunteers for being a part of the year. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, for those of you that have been asking over the past couple of years um, to see Chelsea and Smoke on the Mountain, she's going in, I think, one time this year, and that's Tuesday night, and it's at the IMAX. Um, local tickets are $11, so if you want to come support, I know the Moors will be there, I'm going to be there as well. If you don't know what it is, it's a, it's a play of music set in 1938 in the church, so it's got a lot of old hymns and things like that, it's a really fun show. So if you want to come check it out, your chance is Tuesday, 8 o'clock at the IMAX. Don't say you weren't told. All right, anybody else have any announcements? All right, if not, would you please stand? He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we're dismissed. <laughs>